The built environment is not only about the marriage of form and function. It is also about identity and emotions. How do designers identify the goals when it comes to how clients or users or the public want to feel? What are the factors, materials, environment, and styles involved when looking at emotional goals and design principles? Is emotional intelligence a key characteristic of a good designer? Hello everyone, my name is Monita Rajpal. Welcome to The Drawing Board, a WATG podcast where we explore the ideas, the issues, and the trends that are being discussed within the design community today, as well as among clients and customers. On this episode, I am joined by WATG's Brian Algio, Senior Vice President, Architect and Master Planner, and Shin Lee, Associate Vice President and Senior Planner. Throughout his 32-year career, Brian has developed an holistic design approach to master planning, architecture, and landscape architecture. His core expertise lies in creating and delivering integrated mixed-use residential, resort, and urban design projects with a focus on hospitality and guest experience. Integrating and coordinating different disciplinary teams, Shin brings together experts from various disciplines across transportation, environmental planning, infrastructure and engineering, landscape, architecture, and economic development to ensure the most cost-effective design and outcome for clients. Welcome to both of you. Thank you so much for being with me here. So much of what you both do is deciphering human behavior, and then communicating those findings through design. You are translating a vision and how someone's going to use a space or structure based on their behavior into a workable design. Talk me through that process. Let's start with you, Brian. There is a whole nuance early stage in the design process that is not about aesthetics, materiality, or but it's, it's all about interaction of people and how people use space and how people perceive space and what draws people back to places. You know, what makes a successful destination is not really how well it photographs. You know, in many cases, it's proven out in safety. It's proven out connectivity to community, diversity of people. People really do get energy from other cultures. And so, yeah, there's a lot of, I mean, she will be able to talk to this really well as, as well, but a really a lot about connectivity and identity and community. Those are kind of the three things. The sociology is a big part of it, and we probably know more about that than we know or than we can really claim because, you know, designing these destinations really does require you to sort of get into the head of the people who are going to be using it. And then when we go and experience space, we, we're always looking for those nuances that why is this place successful? Is it the seating or is it the shade and comfort or is it the is it the lighting? Is it is it the energy? You know, so we really try to figure out what it is, and then applying those nuances to then physical design, architecture, planning, landscape. Shin, talk to me about some of the the conversations and how those conversations happen with clients when you are wanting to then decipher how someone wants to feel. I think oftentimes the very first question we engage with client is what is your vision? What is this place about? What is so unique about this project you're trying to build? What kind of people you're trying to attract? And uh, what inherently attracting them? What, what are they trying to get out of this experience? So can anchor what Brian was saying is from WDG's design philosophy, we are so care about the experience. The experience, the unique experience attracting to come here for the first time. And not only for the first time, but continue to come back and offering the best memory. So that really applies to both the, the destination, the more tourist destination we're, we're designing, but also for the community, even for an office campus, we are really emphasize trying to understand what is particular crowd we're trying to attract here and trying to understanding profiling them in a way, what is make this place unique in their particular stage of life. You know, it could be a mom come back to work, a place for, for innovation, what kind of atmosphere uh, expressed through a physical form, uh, meaning the space making, place making, that really can anchor their inherent desire, I want to come here. So mm -hmm. this is really very important, the first step, that the first, very first question we ask our client. It's a real challenge, isn't it? You want to create something that elicits an, almost a sense of awe for some projects, right? There's a sense of mm -hmm. awe. 
But awe and happiness are two different things. Awe and positive feelings are, are two different things. How do you think about that when you approach a project? Is it about creating something that people will say, wow, or it's about making sure that people actually feel good on a long-term basis? You have to do both is the trick, really. I mean, I, what a lot of clients are very focused on that wow moment and that Instagrammable moment, which is is the reality of today. And it is sort of free marketing to their project. And if they can get the right components that people love to photograph and post, then it's really their project gets, the message gets out very quickly. And so we see the value in that, but that is not placemaking. You know, that's, that's sort of a, a moment typically. And so, yeah, the, you have to do both and you have to really create the wow. And sometimes the wow is through the nuances that you don't really can't put your finger on, but it's through comfort and and connectivity again and and community. But sometimes the wow is is that plus plus the the sculpture or the fountain or the tree or the just the celebration of something that's a little different than the other project. So yeah, we, we talk about the the sea of sameness too a lot. You know how everything is everywhere and everybody sees everything. And so how do we help our clients? develop a successful project over a long period of time. I mean, we used to say design in the bottom line, which is a tagline from a couple of decades ago, probably, but um, it's still, I think it still holds true. You know, I think great design draws people in and is a continually, it has, a, it stands the test of time. It's got a sort of future proofing to it and people vote on the best projects with their credit card or with their feet, you know, as you really see. So it, yeah, our projects do stand the test of time, but and it's through this understanding of celebrating, you know, the bigger picture, you know, climate, nature, community, and then as well as celebrating culture and then have that Instagramable moments and those wow moments happening throughout. So it, it's really both. And maybe they're both equally important these days. To me, it feels like it's the Instagramable part is, is a must have, but it's not the place. Many years ago, I interviewed I Am Pei in Paris. And uh, we were at the Louvre, and mm -hmm. he told me that when the glass pyramid was completed, the Parisians, the French, absolutely hated it. And in fact, it made them feel angry, and every time they saw it, they would spit at the pavement in front of it. It evoked such strong emotions in the French, maybe because it was very different to what they were used to. But now, fast forward to today, it is part of French culture. It is part of the Parisian landscape. So when you think, how do you balance that immediate response, which may not be what everyone will want with long-term vision? Well, we see more and more the, from the client perspective, I think at least I feel the change is we kind of are passing this period that's really fast growing real estate, and especially in Asia. This uh, volume increase where the speed kind of uh, in, in initial success, successfulness uh, kind of trump everything else, that, that period seems like at least slowing down. People more care about the quality of the, the place. So that's why we see more and more the client is owning the project, meaning they're not just build and sell and then leave and jump to another project. They have to build their reputation and build the operation side of things. That's really resulting why the initial Instagram moment is important to establish the brand and the reputation of the project. But more importantly, to providing those, uh, what Brian was mentioning, those moments, those uh, nuances that make this, your stay in this project, the development is so comfortable, you can continue be you thinking that this community, this destination is part of your life. I think that's what we see the, the trend. And that's also might be the reason we, in the design process, we need to balance both. We we have, we do need to have, still have the wow moment, but more importantly, to dig into the locale of the project, the, what's the cult, unique cultural characteristic of the place and what's unique about the natural resources of the place and really building a story upon them to make the experience so unique, so attached to the local and abroad customers. There are a lot of studies that have been done and continue to be done about the impact of, or the psychological effects of architecture and design on the human brain. We know that being in close proximity or being exposed to nature has such a positive impact 
on us, on our mood, on our mental health. And as we delve deeper, we see how our brains translate what we see differently. It becomes this evolutionary study of how we consume and how we visualize things, whether it evokes that sense of fight or flight, or it triggers the, the, the pleasure chemicals in our brain as well. And buildings have, and landscapes have that power to do that too. How do you input that as part of the design? And how important is that natural reflection in design, Brian? Yeah, no, that's a great question. I, if I flash to several different projects, what's really important for, in hospitality especially, for people to be there when, you know, to, to be there, you know, and, and to be experiencing the place. And as if we're talking about sort of a world heritage site or an old a village on the coast, we're celebrating that. But if we're on a desert island with the beautiful sea breezes and the sandy beaches and the coral reefs, you know, what, what is the appropriate architecture? What, 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 is, what is being there? And how, and how to let nature do the, the talking and let nature scream out and let the architecture be subtle. I mean, so there's, we worked on projects that were, were looking at nature, we're looking at um, the patterns in nature, the, the colors in nature, the, the, the seasonality of nature and, and how to really capture those moments and really connect people to that. And I just remember something we did in Costa Rica some years ago where, you know, it rains there so much. And, you know, so it wasn't about the shape of the architecture, but it was about capturing that moment when it rains and celebrating the rain and having the rain wash down the wall in the lobby and having the, the rain collection devices were like wind chimes, but when it rained, they would move. And, you know, so it's about really this moment that you, you could really just celebrate Costa Rica. You come from LA or you come from New York and, and, you know, it's a whole different experience. And, and why think about umbrellas and jackets when you think about rain? You, you more think about this beauty of nature. And that's why everything's so green and the place and the rivers. And so, yeah, and there's the, everything from that to desert islands in Saudi Arabia that, that you know, need this sort of depth of experience. You know, so then we draw from the shape of the sand dunes or the mangroves and the root structures and and really create an architecture that that is not not um, kitschy or it needs to be, you know, architecturally beautiful and stand the test of time and be buildable again. I mean, a lot of the projects that we see today are, are renderings, you know, so it's, it's about how do you really create that celebration in a, in a, in a viable architecture and shape and landscape that really work in the marketplace for our clients and, and for the guests. Yeah. And then when you were talking earlier, I was thinking about landscape architecture, you know, you were talking about the, you know, celebrating the outdoors. And, and when we started landscape, you know, it might be 20 years ago now, um, it was just for that reason. We were architects, you know, we were, and you know, we were thinking, you know, that what do our guests really remember when they come to our projects? And it's a lot of times it's the landscape because they're in the, it's in the sun belt or in the tropics and it's about the outdoors. And, and so instead of going into doing airports or let's, let's go do schools, you know, why don't we do landscape and it'll just add to what we do and sort of be this more holistic solution. Same with interiors. It was, they remember the interiors and they remember the landscape. And many times it's not about the architecture and it is about how you capture natural light and capture the breezes and the coloration that you tie the sea or the beach or the forest into the interior spaces. So yeah, there's, there's, and wellness is this whole move that I feel like we've been doing for a long time, but it's much more amplified today. And it is about, all the all the data that we know that, that is sort of the human spirit sort of reacts to and it is natural light and it is connection to nature and, and it is comfort and and so we know much more about that today than we did 10 20 years ago and so how do we react to it but what, what, how do buildings change and shin is an expert at at you know sustainability and and really creating solutions that that react to place and that's as important as well yeah, Shin, you mentioned to me earlier, it's a perfect combination, isn't it, of what you call the hardware and the software? Yeah, exactly. Um, like Brian mentioned, I think, right, these days, uh, not only the customer, the client, they really um, realize the, the, the design reflecting uh, the, the emotion demand and the emotion moment of the customer is so important that what really hook and click with them then in is the the challenge to a, a designer is how you find that uh, moment. I can use that one example, like my current project we're doing that we're working a wellness village in China. 
And uh, we are so looking into researches but like Canyon Ranch. I don't know if you heard about that project. It's all about celebrating wellness, celebrating health, healthy lifestyle. So how can we lifting that kind of example to a, uh, to another project like thousands of miles away? How you how you embed it into and our client remind us. By the way, we not only wanted the hardware, the all the programming, all the cool spots, all the all the all the fitness, you know, in the nature setting, but we want you to consider those spiritual moment. They call spiritual moment where beyond the body and they we really want to emphasize mindfulness and a spiritual moment. So what we did is we really look into, as Brian mentioned in a lot of his project, is what is the unique natural setting. Can creating that one pavilion is sometimes a very simple. It's a white wall with a round window and open to a bamboo forest. And you mm-hmm. imagine yourself as a um, yoga mat. And, and this is your cultural revenance. And this is your, your wild wow moment, but it's very quiet wild wow moment. So these are kind of uh, uh, moments we're trying to capture in our design is really trying to balancing, you know, what is a functional, functional um, a requirement of a project versus you know maybe you you might feel the space initially is 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 too empty but it's really a good vacant place that really kind of kind of attached to people's emotion how do you translate that to an urban setting then how do you do that through the hardware and the software yes in the urban environment the challenge is really for designers relying more and more on the various design techniques. I think the urban refill really provide a u- very unique, good opportunity. I, if you can track in the last five years, all the major architecture award, most of them goes into refurbish, reuse, rebuild in the urban, urban centers. Those are providing a very, really good opportunity to creating that kind of a, a more quiet wellness space in the middle of the, 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 the city. Um, I think we usually approach this to a few different angles. One is creating those microclimate, so those light touch on the landscape. Sometimes, it, it, like I mentioned in the, in the previous example, the space doesn't, doesn't need to be very big. It could, and also looking at the acoustic environment. This is something very new uh, to our day-to-day design. It's, very, it's not new in academic world, but you know the clients starting asking how the wellness experience, how the relaxation experience can be reflected in the urban. Maybe it's a waterfall, the sound of a bird, the sound of, sound of the, the water. And then you need to creating those landscape. You know, we study the species, what kind of a, a plantations, what kind of landscape can actually attracting those various birds and bees and creating those natural sound in a very busy, buzzy urban yeah. environment. So those are very, you know, it's it very need to be very surgically done because as you as you mentioned, the urban project always have coming very a lot of challenges. It's really how to balance the economic, financial side of feasibility of project versus finding every single opportunity to creating those 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 pocket space, pocket environment. Shin remind you remind me of the project we worked on that we were trying to make this city one of the top 100 cities in the world. And we started looking at the criteria for that, and it wasn't it wasn't all economic. It was definitely had this sort of wellness components to it. It had to do with diversity and educational opportunities and housing and, and important elements like that. But it also had um, you know percentage of open space per person and, and parks and connectivity and this happiness factor and you know these it had these nuanced sort of soft metrics that were really interesting for us to dive into and. And we, we did notice that that particular city was uh, lacking open space, just lacking parks and lacking opportunities for sport and for competition and, and you know, jogging paths, bike riding paths and this whole mobility that's evolving, you know, so quickly now um, it was their key. And, and then having these moments, these special moments for, for special events, you know, to sort of create sort of this excitement and buzz about about place and about events that happen throughout the seasons. And so we're talking about stadiums and larger parks and connectivity to families and children. And so it, it was it was really interesting to look at this, you know, top 100 city, the criteria and diving into that. How essential do you think it needs to be that urban planning, landscape planning, architecture, design, all be part of public health because of the impact it has on our emotional and mental well-being. 
Yeah, it, I think it's very, very critical. And actually, I think it's already happening right now. As as you, you are we already aware that healthy city is a, such a hot topic in addition to sustainable cities. And there's a lot of research like CDC working with USGBC has already published a lot of uh, very influential publications and researches to prove how important to provide the physical um, facilities, the environment in a community, in a city to really helping to ensure the mental and the physical healthness of the residents and, and the workers that live, live, work, play there. So I think it's extremely, extremely important for planners and the architects and landscape to really think that in day one of your design, how are our, our design responding to those needs? Of course, we're relying on a lot on things like uh, LEED standard, you know, published by USGBC. There's also a lot of healthy city indicator that we use to measure our design to ensure at least at design stage there, these are things, you know, we can do. You know, I just want to add one more point that on uh, the previous questions, you know, in the urban cities, of course, for, for, um, every single space is so precious and every and you have to do multi-functions. That's the trend, the multi-functional spaces. And we look into vertical spaces, vertical greenery. You know, I work a few projects in Singapore, and this is one of the city very successfully implement urban policies that really encourage the greenery, those the rooftop space being very actively used by the citizens, by the residents, um, you know, as a recreation. And we can see the move of architecture, landscape and architecture, the lines blurring. You know, you can see so many great designs that really leverage in rooftops, seamless connection to the landscape. So what we call the landscape architecture truly become landscape architecture uh, offering to, to the city. That's another way to really ensure that the design can provide all the facility and space needed by the users. So Brian, what kind of then responsibility do you feel that you have? It is important, it's extremely important. I know that's, that sounds very simplistic to say. We haven't really thought about our emotional and mental well-being in a very open way as we do now. And noticing all that impacts us in a positive or, or negative way, and that includes design. So what kind of responsibility do you feel that you have? The responsibility is is uh, enormous, and it's it's a lot to take on, but it's it's what, as a company, as a firm, we are committed to really reaching goals and as far as net zero, net positive, trying to create neighborhood and community that that are um, pushing the limits of this concept of wellness and wellness for for mankind, but also wellness for the planet. And Shin and I just this week have said no to an opportunity that we would have probably said yes to a couple of years ago or maybe a year ago that that so as we mature in our in our understanding and our commitment and our philosophy of what, what doing good is and and what the right thing to do is we're we, we are starting to to be more strict with our go no go process and our client selection and our project selection because it is vital and it is vital to our firm and, and our our ethos and where we want to be you know where we think we are but we know we need to push and so over the next eight years we're pushing ourselves very very far and so we're, we're shin's part of our team uh mapping out what that means and and how we as a as a design firm engage with with our clients and our projects and you know so it's it's extremely important and you know we're 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 still maturing in this process and you know covid and and the whole what we've been through it has opened our eyes to a different way to think through community and urban design i mean we already with shen we've already looking at how to design a new city for for this concept of lockdown and 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 what what that could mean to community and and walkability and and really sort of a real a new focus on what mixed use means you know and clinics and grocery and entertainment and education and and you know the radius maybe is getting smaller in some cities is walking um, distance in order to to have compartmentalized moments when needed to allow people to live but not uh, have to travel across town or not have to to go as far as before to get to do what they need to do you know so it's it's a new way of thinking but at the same time human nature is sort of developed over long, long time and there's certain things that we like and there's diversity and it's not the same neighbors every day. It's about getting to to the city center and the town square and and learning from each other. So, you know, it's 
it's a complicated moment, but it's, it's actually exciting. I think everybody's a little more serious about, about wellness and spirituality and, and connectivity. What do you feel in terms of design and materials? What do we respond to? Is it patterns, specific patterns? Is it flow? What kind of rhythm is it that we respond to? I'm working on two projects in the United States, one in ski country up in Mammoth and one in Boulder up in University. And in both places, we're, what we're trying to do is we're really looking at locally sourcing materials. And it's more difficult in some places like Mammoth than it is in, in places like Boulder as Denver and everything so connected. But this is a rustication is sort of a natural materials, materials that are that are connected to place and that and that give the spirit of of texture and of nature and natural, you know, and tied to the palettes of, of the surroundings. And we're, you know, to me, I, not so much about patterning to me. I mean, I, I think it's, it's, it's about, it's about sort of a, a texture and a natural rustication of, of materials, but then how to do that in a contemporary way to really create a project that's fresh and is not looking that that's been a challenge in Boulder, for example, because, you know, Boulder is many brick buildings and, the module of, of construction is is the brick, and and how do we take that and create a bit of a larger building and and have it feel like it belongs and have people have it have a human scale to it and people connect to it and have it durable in a in university environment. So so many different challenges. Then in Mammoth, for example, it's the materiality is is tied a lot to the weather and the huge snow load that they get and you know that, that some of those sort of factors. So. Yeah, I think people react to natural materials that they can understand. And, yeah. and I think reflectivity and many times foreign materials will create, take the, a space and, you know, you've been in a space where the sun is reflecting off the building or, the, you know, it creates that heat and that over those microclimates that Shin is talking about. Many times the materialities and the color palettes you pick um, have a lot to do with the comfort of the surrounding spaces. Yeah, it goes back to the evolutionary psychology, right? How crucial is it for architects, for designers, for planners to be emotionally intelligent? I think it's extremely important. You have to put yourself as the user first. If you cannot be moved by your own design, how can you imagine the end user going to be have the same kind of feeling? So I think it's extremely important to put yourself into the end user, into the guests, and understanding what we're trying to get out of this experience and really be very sensitive to that kind of emotion. And they're kind of leveraging from that, that emotion, you know, kind of uh, tag along what Brian was saying. Uh, as a planner, I'm a planner. As a planner, I, I feel what really makes the, the, the guests kind of click with the, the design is it's actually their own um, growing experience. You know, we work on a project in Jeddah, Saudi, we work on a project in China, you know, two coastal villages very similar setting. If you imagine, you can imagine the history, why the village to be there are very similar, you know, trading pod, it's a fishing village, but it's so different from a cultural perspective because how the, how the village evolves. So our design really need to capture that nuances. What make this place unique from materiality um, perspective, from the cultural perspective, this is what we feel more and more extremely important that um, no matter as a local visitor or international visitor, and they are very easily to connecting their personal emotion to the patterning, which reflecting on the cultural, or to the material, which is very local, or the way the local people interpret then the nature. So those three things add together become so unique, and everyone can get a piece of out of it. And no matter you are local visitor or an international traveler. So you will, you will feel really attached to that, that particular project. I love that. Shin, yeah. Brian, thank you both so much for your time. This has been incredible. Malita, thank you for having us. It's been, it's been great fun and uh, really appreciate the moment. Thank Think you. about these topics. Thank you. Thank you both. That was WATG's Shin Lee and Brian Algio joining me from California. You've been listening to The Drawing Board, a WATG podcast. I'm Onita Rajpal. Thank you for joining us.